to the Yeti microphone with some adjustments and we'll see if they actually work. All right, lots of people have tattoos nowadays. Some people get tattoos that have meaning and others get tattoos just because they look cool or maybe a little bit of both. That's where I stand, a little bit of both. And as you'd probably guess, I have some animal tattoos. And what do you get when you combine tattoos of animals and a YouTube channel dedicated to talking about said animals? That's right, content. I've decided to dedicate each one to a video in my new Tattoo Safari series. I've been on YouTube for four months and I already have like 12 series going on. Because why not? You get a series and 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 you get a series. Starting with the cheetah. As you can see, this is a tattoo of a cheetah, but not just any cheetah. It's a portrait of a cheetah I worked with in Namibia named Koya. Yeah, I named my cat after him. I'll show you pictures of it. Model, feisty. I love it. So I got a tattoo of him. I got it done like two years ago by Sean Harder in Hermosa Beach. Here's his Instagram. He does incredible work and he's actually gonna be finishing up my sleeve because I have some space in the next couple of months. It will be another animal tattoo. Let me give you a hint. It's very intelligent. Wait, is that a good enough? Um, they're very smart. And the portrait that he did of Koya is absolutely sick. He killed it. Cheetahs are my favorite animal, which might seem a bit basic considering the types of animals that I talk about on this channel, but it's because of their personalities that I got to know while working with them and everything else I learned along the way that puts them at the top of my list. So let's just jump right into the cheetah. As always, we're gonna get the general information out of the way. This will include some information that you are definitely familiar with, since a lot of people are familiar with the cheetah. But it'll also give you a little bit of stuff that I picked up on while working with them. So of course, cheetahs are the fastest cursorial terrestrial animal, or the fastest running animal, with a top recorded speed of 70 miles per hour. The peregrine falcon can dive at like 240 miles per hour, which is why I said cheetahs are the fastest running animal, so nobody decides to be a smart ass in the comments. So obviously they are completely adapted for short bursts of incredible speed. They are tall and slender, with an average height of about three feet and weigh somewhere between 70 to 130 pounds. Those numbers alone might not give off the impression that they are slender because that is kind of heavy, but compared to leopards, which are like two feet tall and can weigh somewhere between 50 and 160 pounds, cheetahs are definitely elongated. Let me put it this way. If cats were dogs, cheetah would be a greyhound and a leopard would be a pit bull. Let me quickly tell you how to tell the two apart because a lot of people mix them up, especially when talking about prints, cheetah print and leopard print. Cheetahs have spots, filled in spots, while leopards have rosettes, which are kind of like hollowed out spots. Cheetah print, leopard print. Okay, cheetahs also have a very powerful tail that kind of acts like a rudder during their short sprints and helps keep them balanced during sharp turns during a chase. They have an enlarged heart, liver, and enlarged adrenal glands, an extremely flexible spine to help elongate their stride, and they have blunt, semi-retractable claws to help grip the ground when running fast. That is actually where their genus name comes from, which I'm ashamed to say, I don't exactly know how to pronounce because it's fucking weird. Asinonics, achinonics, achinonics, I have no idea. But it means non-moving claws. That's their genus name. Their species name, Jubatus, means maned. That refers to the fluff on the backs of cheetah cups that help them camouflage when their mom is out hunting. Unbelievably stupid cute. They eventually grow out of that fluff and rely on their spots that we all know and love to camouflage. And what about their tear marks that they are arguably even more famous for? Those help keep the sun out of their eyes, kind of like football players with the black lines that they do. And all of these adaptations combine to give you a streamlined, major league, fast as lightning, sissy, yeah, sissy. They are certified wimps. <laughs> Oh my word, children. Cheetahs are all bark and no bite. Their adaptations for speed meant a trade-off for strength. They don't stand a chance against any predator that wants to steal their kill, so they run away. To be honest, if you found yourself up against a wild cheetah, you could probably take it. I'm just saying, like, please don't find yourself in that situation, but that's the truth. And I'm speaking strictly wild. A cheetah that's comfortable around humans will maul your ass. They can also be picky eaters. In the wild, they go after smaller antelope species like gazelle and springbok because of their smaller size. Females live and hunt alone unless they have cubs. Males will form small groups called coalitions, so they are able to take down larger prey as a team. And they'll kind of carve a bowl into the carcass as they're eating, keeping the meat off the ground. And that can translate to their eating habits in captivity. A lot of the cheetahs I worked with refused to eat any meat that touched the ground. So we would feed them in big bowls. Actually, the cheetah that I have a tattoo of, Koya, would put like half of his body in the bowl and eat that way with his paws in it. Cheetahs are picky and they talk a lot of shit. They growl, they hiss, they spit. I've been spit at by them multiple times. Oh my Lord, I felt that one. And they can be very dramatic. They chirp, meow, squeak, purr, <laughs> but they do not roar. Which brings me to my final generic fact before we get into the good stuff. Cheetahs are not technically big cats, which is like the most annoying, well, actually, in the entire world. I'm guilty of saying it. But cheetahs are not considered true big cats. They are large cats, but they are not part of the big cat genus, Panthera. That's what it takes to be a true big cat, which might be confusing right now, but I'm gonna try and clear that up by jumping into the evolution of the cheetah. Today, there are give or take 36 species of cats. And of course, plenty of extinct cats, including the famous Smilodon and other saber-toothed cat species and more. 
and the first cats, the first true cats, emerged sometime between 35 and 25 million years ago. One of these earliest cats that we have fossil evidence of is called Proaleurus, alive about 25 million years ago in Eurasia. Proaleurus was somewhere between the size of a domestic cat and an ocelot, and fossil evidence suggests they spent a good amount of time in the trees. But just to be clear, Proaleurus is not the ancestor to all cats, just considered one of those first cats that we know of. And as these early cats evolved, new subdivisions emerged into what we can consider eight cat lineages, one of which was the panther lineage, which includes all the true big cats, lions, tigers, jaguars, leopards, and snow leopards. All of them can roar except for snow leopards, but we will continue that conversation at another time. Another lineage that emerged was the puma lineage. Fuck, I gotta see how that's pronounced. Jaguarundi. This includes the puma, the cheetah, and the jaguarundi. The jaguarundi is a smaller wild cat native to Central and South America that just looks like a menace. Am I giving too much background information? I don't know. This is my favorite topic. I literally just don't know where to stop. Okay, the point is big cats emerged from one branch while cheetahs and pumas emerged from a different branch in the same tree. That's why they're not considered the same. It's like apples and oranges are both round fruit, but they are not the same. Let's turn our attention to the Puma lineage. The Puma lineage seems to have emerged about 6.7 million years ago, and as I said, includes the modern cheetah, puma, and jaguarundi. I've been spit on by two-thirds of this lineage, the cheetah and the puma. Maybe one day I'll go three for three. I've actually never seen a jaguarundi in real life. I don't know what I would think. They are unique. Maybe they don't spit. Anyway, the ancestors to all of these cats emerged in North America. The ancestors of pumas and jaguarundis headed south, while cheetahs headed west over to Asia over the Bering Strait land bridge, which has popped in and out of significance throughout recent geologic time, depending on the climate situation, i.e. ocean levels due to the Ice Age. The Bering Strait land bridge allowed Homo sapiens to migrate from Asia to North America, as well as woolly mammoths and countless other species. And cheetahs went the opposite way across this bridge about 100,000 years ago. This was a really significant moment for a couple reasons. First off, this allowed them to expand their range to Asia, Europe, and Africa, a nearly worldwide distribution. But at what cost? Their first genetic bottleneck. A genetic bottleneck is when a population becomes massively reduced, resulting in a huge loss in genetic diversity. Genetic diversity is good because having variations in traits in a population means that the population will be able to adapt more easily to changes in that environment. A population of say 1500 individuals is going to produce genetically diverse offspring because you have a lot of variations in genetic material to deal with. But if something happens and suddenly that population of 1500 becomes a population of 15, now there's much less genetic material to mix and match. And if shit goes south and that tiny population doesn't have the trait variations to adapt, there, SOL, shit out of luck. Genetic bottlenecks generally lead to inbreeding in the remaining population because there is literally no other option other than extinction. So that just fucks shit up genetically even more. Cheetahs are kind of the poster child for genetic bottlenecks because they have experienced not one, but at least two genetic bottlenecks in the last 100,000 years. Actually, I made a skit about it a while back on TikTok. She's your sister. We are it wasn't my best. There's really no good way to go about a skit about prehistoric incest, but you live and you learn. So the first genetic bottleneck most likely happened around 100,000 years ago because of that migration out of North America. This left populations too spread out to interbreed, which resulted in a loss of genetic diversity. But the second genetic bottleneck was much worse. It makes the first one look puny. The second bottleneck happened around 12,000 years ago, which is a significant time in recent prehistory because that, of course, was the end of the last ice age. Tons of megafauna went extinct, and so did the North American and European cheetah populations. Gone. Dunzo. Dunzo. The African population barely made it out. Scientists estimate that their numbers dropped to as few as seven individuals. Seven that were all closely related to each other. So of course, shit got genetically terrible. Wait, you're probably wondering how scientists figured this out. I should tell you how they know this. Like most of the insight gained in recent years about evolutionary relationships, this was determined through genetic analysis. <laughs> An international team of researchers sequenced the genomes of several cheetahs, one from Cheetah Conservation Fund in Namibia, three wild cheetahs from Namibia, and three wild cheetahs from Tanzania and found out some very cool shit. <gasps> There's a spider. Shit, shit, God damn it. Dude, I can't do this right now. I can't do this right now. <sighs> I can talk about spiders all day, but I don't want them in my room. I don't want them in my room. I'm keeping my eye on you. All right, hmm. here's the paper if you wanna read that paper. So anyway, that tiny population of African cheetahs did what they had to do to survive and somehow did it against the odds and eventually got their numbers back to over 100,000 by the 1800s. But at what 
cost. Well, today they only have about 5% of the genetic variation you'd expect in a species living today. 5%. And they have a number of abnormalities that can be seen to some varying degree in all cheetahs alive today. To name just a few, they have crowded lower incisors, kinked tails, asymmetric skulls, and a low sperm count or sperm abnormalities. As you might know, cheetahs are listed as vulnerable on the IUCN because although they were able to recover after that second genetic bottleneck, there are only about 7,000 cheetahs alive in the wild today. This is the part of the video where I explain why cheetahs have been disappearing, but I want to assure you that this will end with successful conservation efforts that are being put in place now that you can contribute to or get involved in if you want to. So there are several threats cheetahs face as a vulnerable species. To name a few of them, there's habitat loss, human wildlife conflict, and because their genetic diversity is so low, this leaves them incredibly... <sighs> it's so big! Okay. This leaves them incredibly susceptible to disease and other environmental stressors on top of that. Another one is the illegal wildlife trade. Since the days of the Egyptian empire, cheetahs were taken from the wild and tamed and kept as companion animals. And as time went on and people continued to use them as status symbols, their populations plummeted. Because on top of everything else they got going on, they do not breed well in captivity. I don't support any wild animals being kept as pets, captive breeding or not. I feel like I don't have to say that, but just so we're clear. But it makes the situation significantly worse that they're being taken from the wild rather than captive breeding programs. One organization that is actively working to combat all of these threats is Cheetah Conservation Fund, which I had the honor of interning at in college at their site in Namibia. My time there is where I learned all of this information about cheetahs and where all the cute videos that I've shown you came from and where Koya, my tattooed cheetah, lives. CCF has several departments. The one I was working in was animal husbandry because they take in injured and orphaned cheetahs from around Namibia. But they also have a site in Somaliland, a breakaway territory in Somalia, that they use to rescue cheetahs that are being smuggled out of Africa through the illegal wildlife trade. I could literally go on forever about all the work they do because it has completely changed my approach to zoology as a whole. And of course, inspired the art that I decided to get permanently placed on my body. If you watched my introduction video, you know that one of my dreams for this channel is to go back to CCF and do a series highlighting everything that they do and what it's like to live and work there. So I'm going to save the rest of my rambling for them and send you to their website, cheetah.org, if you want to check out more of what they do now. And if you want to check out more of the work that my tattoo artist Sean does, you can go to his Instagram. I'll put a link to both of them in the description. And if you like this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next long form video coming out next week. And you can keep up with my daily short form content on TikTok and Instagram. And for now, stay curious. The world has a lot for us to learn. See ya!